Welcome back, everyone, to Episode 2 of the History Hour, where we will be continuing our discussion of Mesopotamia. I'm Mr. Kent. And I'm Professor White. First off, I'd like to say that hopefully the audio quality in this version will be a tiny bit better. We, uh, we, we should have looked at the first episode a little more closely. We'll be doing our best to improve. But the thing is, this is our this is really our first project, and we barely know how to edit, let alone record properly. So if you stick with us, hopefully we'll get a little bit better. We'll keep putting out these episodes, and hopefully you enjoy it. I would just like to say, what we're going over is based a lot on the readings we've done and uh, one of the classes I sat through when I was in college. But some of this material is from some decades ago, and the class I took was nearly 10 years ago now. If you come across newer research on your own or that someone else has gone through, chances are they may be a little bit more accurate than us. They may have discovered more things already. If there are conflicting sources, a good idea is to check on where they're getting the information, when it's dated to, and that sort of thing. And also, just go ahead and use common sense and don't believe those people who tell you that aliens built, you know, the Sumerian pyramids and that people who hadn't quite figured out pants or paper to write on and then uh, a Mars base. So I think a trend we're probably going to have in most of these episodes will be going back and commenting on the previous episode a little bit just to reinforce some points we made or clarify some things after we listen to ourselves in the editing room and decide there may be more or less we want to say on this. So going back to the first episode, I would like to point out again that we, we took a couple shots at Bible literalism and that's kind of going to necessarily be a, a thing that happens. If not explicitly, just by the matter of fact that we're talking about a period that the Bible very much disagrees with in this very early Bronze Age point. And it's not to say the Bible is entirely unbelievable and we can't use it for some sourcing, but it's similar to say the statues we used to figure out what Akkadian society was, where the Akkadian king is standing two or three times the height of anyone else and wearing a hat that's reserved for the gods. Does it mean that we should believe that the Akkadians literally became gigantic divine god kings who crushed the entire enemy army? Probably not, but that thing does have something to tell us about that society. We can learn something from that. It's kind of an issue that you have to take with any document from that time period. It's a valuable source, potentially, but everything has to be cross-referenced, compared and contrasted with other sources. We cannot take everything that people said literally. It's just not good scholarship. And if we go with some of the most ravenous ideas of Bible literalism, the young earth, if we assume that the earth is only 6,000-ish years old, that would have to assume that the earth was created in 4,000 B.C., which is what, the period of right before Rook Ubayad? Yeah, it's pretty late in the historical record, honestly. In this episode, as well as the last one, we're going to talk some about the Stone Age, and assuming the Earth is 6,000 years old means that didn't even happen. Or it happened in the course of, what, a few decades? That's pretty unrealistic, unfortunately. The other major thing that I want to address from the first episode is we threw around the word civilization a little bit, and I want to kind of address that. This is the thing. Civilization is actually a very loaded word. It can be used in ways that are... Well, political in some senses, but also in a sort of derogatory way. To say one group is civilized can be used to imply, oh, that culture is better or in some way superior to another. To classify some area as uncivilized has a connotation of being you know, primitive, brutish, inferior in some fashion. When we say civilization, we're using it in a historical context. And in a historical context, the word civilization simply means some culture that has what are called the six recognizable elements of civilization. In this case being cities, government, religion, the written word, some kind of economic system and a social structure connected to it, as well as the clear evidence of artistic intellectual activity. To a historian, a culture that has those six things is a civilization. A culture that does not have those things is a proto-civilization. It doesn't really mean anything more than that to a historian. And I think people are too willing to fall into the trap of trying to look at various cultural and civilizational groups and saying, well, this one is superior morally or ethically for whatever reason. But really, if you want to look back at this period, we addressed in the first episode the idea of religious or political groups destroying artifacts because they disagreed with it. Westerners did plenty of damage to the various Sumerian 
and other ancient sites they discovered. In the Harappan ruins, which are extremely old, those of the Indus Valley civilization, the British basically did damage to it simply for neglect. They tore it up, they used it for building material, they ran it over with some of their vehicles, and they just destroyed these ancient pieces of uh, civilization. And there was a similar thing with Napoleon. Yeah, there's a pretty famous case of a French artillery unit firing shots at the Sphinx just for fun, really. I think it would be a trap to say because the religious group wants to destroy it because they see it as decadent or pagan, or the revolutionary communist group wants to destroy it because it represents a more oppressive society. I think it's a trap to say that is inherently worse than someone shooting at the Sphinx for boredom, for funsies. That's certainly a complete malice toward human history and the artifacts that commonly we hold in a collective past. In the first episode, we talked somewhat about Bronze Age warfare, and we'll certainly be talking about a lot again today. We're not going to get into a ton of specifics of how wars were fought and what we find and whatnot. We may reference it a tiny bit, but if you'd like to know more about that, I did rewatch something I've seen in the past. An individual who was on YouTube called Lindy Beige has an episode covering a Bronze Age battle. It occurred much later than the period we talked about in the first episode. It occurred about in 1250 BC, but it occurs in North Europe, in Germany. So they're a little bit behind the tech curve, and it's probably fairly similar warfare weapons tech to what you may have been seen in roughly the period we're talking about. I, I could give you a good idea of what the scale of warfare was like, the sort of wounds people encounter, the sort of struggles that archaeologists and historians have trying to learn from it and catalog what happened. If that's something you'd be interested in learning more about, I highly recommend you go check that video out in addition to what we have to say. On the second portion of our discussion over Mesopotamian history, I think an interesting topic to bring up, and probably one we're going to have to talk about again because it comes up so many times throughout history, is what exactly is ethnicity? It, it gets brought up a lot, and we talked about it a little bit in last episode, and I think it's, an, it's a thing we should discuss a little bit here to talk about what we mean and just the general broad strokes, especially when it relates to this era. When we look at Mesopotamia and ethnicity, the question becomes, what exactly is a Mesopotamia? We began last episode by talking about up to almost half a million years past. When we're talking about half a million years ago, that is not the Homo sapiens species in Mesopotamia. While they may be people living between those two rivers, they may be people in the Middle East and the Levant in that area, and we may refer to them as that, most likely you're looking at some sort of other hominid species. Most likely Homo erectus or Homo heidelbergensis or something else similar. The recent exit from Africa theory, which is the one that is considered more prominent and more accepted by the scientific community in general, places the modern humans, the Homo sapien species, as leaving Africa at roughly 270,000 to 115,000 years ago. So about a quarter of a million years ago or less. And we also talk about Neanderthals being in the Middle East. It would not have been Neanderthals there a half million years ago. Because Neanderthals, the, the current oldest examples we have of them are roughly 250,000 years old, whereas the oldest is uh, about 315,000 years old, meaning the Neanderthals as a species might be slightly older than Homo sapiens, though Neanderthals very likely could have been the Middle East prior to them, or it could have been a flowing migratory pattern as we see so much later in Mesopotamian history. This is a period that is extremely early. In fact, just for reference, the earliest example we have for certain, that close exist is about 170,000 years ago. So when you're talking about what species there and if they're Mesopotamians, it's a very primitive material culture. The difference between a Mesopotamian and a European at this point would have been nearly indistinguishable except for possibly phenotypic mutations and like. When we talk about these people living in caves and these people living in Mesopotamia, it's possible these proto-cities and these cave networks could have been inhabited by multiple species. There's caves in Asia they found where you have suspected Homo erectus and then uh, Gendrosovan and then the Homo sapiens all living in their different generations thousands of years apart for thousands of years at a time. That could have easily been the case. Does that mean that the original Mesopotamians were those Homo erectus and the Homo sapiens and that Neanderthals were the outsiders? When we talk later in this episode and others, we're going to talk about the people who are considered to be outsiders who came in. How the Akkadians were even considered somewhat outsiders from the Sumerians. How then you had stuff like the Gutians 
and the Semitic peoples of Kish, and later you have the Amorites and the Kassites. But in reality, they're from a neighboring region, and they have a fairly similar culture. Could one argue that they're really, really that different when you compare, say, the early humans coming and replacing the Iron Falls? And so, if we recognize the people of the Ubayad or the Uruk or earlier periods, these Homo sapiens, as legitimately having claim to the title Mesopotamian, does that disqualify the people who were there before them from being called the same thing? And if not, is it really fair to say outsiders came? Because the outsiders often lived in the same cities, adopted the same sorts of styles, even at times adopted the same culture and language over generations. Most likely, that's a very similar process to what has been happening there and all across the world throughout all of history. When you look at what actually makes a person what they are, what makes a tribe or a people what they are, there's a lot of different factors that you can look at, and not all of those factors would have been immediately apparent to the groups at that time. When we talk about ethnicity, then you can get into discussions about haplogroup, which if you trace the mitochondrial DNA way, way back, you can kind of tell what migration pattern you kind of came from and what region of the world you sell, you sell them, be at least one line of your ancestors. And there is a sort of ability to categorize, but in reality, there's a lot of mixing of those. If you look at those haplogroup charts, they're not 100%. Not every person in China comes from haplogroup C, for example. There's still plenty from other earlier ones who at some point either got conquered or interbred or their culture just merged into such a way that they were indistinguishable. And that's the same case in Africa. It's the same case in North America. And as you have the mixing of the different groups through trade and colonization and just general globalism and people not having the same barriers to being able to interact with each other, that becomes less and less of a distinction. In addition, that same line of haplogroups and ethnicity, there's the idea of race. But really, what is race? Race is often kind of considered to be, you know, what continent you came from or what your phenotypic appearances are. There is so many cases of the different groups mixing with one another, the, the migratory patterns of different peoples, the trade between different peoples, it ends up in a pattern where to distinguish between race is not a very precise, it's not very scientific. And if you hear these people make claims such as the bell curve, and you can distinguish between intelligence due to race, that's, that's a bunch of hogwash that's been more or less roundly debunked for years and years and years, and they're just peddling discredited bunk. So to, to take it back to Mesopotamia for a moment, that really kind of leads us into something that the historian George Rowe called the Sumerian problem, which is this question of who are these people living in Mesopotamia and how do you really distinguish them? We talked about the you know, Sumerians in the south of the Persian Gulf. But there are other groups around them, the Akkadians a little further north, uh, the Amorites, the Assyrians in the far north, the Syrians, the Iranians, the Arabs, the ancestors of groups like the Jews and others. You know, all these people are divided into different groups. But what does that division even mean? Not a lot, as you find out. Ethnically, these groups are virtually identical. Genetically, there's minor variation based on migratory patterns. But again, they're all homo sapiens. More than that, the Sumerians themselves, even though they differentiate themselves as a unique group, that's really only a cultural group. These are language groups in this period of time. The Sumerians speak a language that is somewhat unique to that region and seems unrelated to others. Everyone else, though, what do they call themselves, Babylonian or Akkadian or Assyrian or Arab or whatever, they're simply people who are speaking a different language or a different group of languages, often called Semitic, which is a, unfortunately a loaded term as well. But what makes it even more complicated is Sumerian isn't just a language group. It's also an alphabet. It's also a religion. It's a style of political organization. It's art and material culture. And we take it to that level, there's virtually no difference. The Akkadians are living in almost the exact same way, often worshiping the same gods. The same is true for these other groups as well. And over thousands, hundreds, and thousands of years, these groups often adopt more Sumerian culture. Even after the Sumerian language dies, its culture survived and is still adopted and passed on. But we really can't call these ethnic groups in any real sense. We can call them cultural groups. That's about it. Which is interesting because in later periods you see this replayed again. 
Think about, for example, the early Middle Ages. Think about the kingships that formed out of the fall of the Roman Empire. Those names often correspond to a sort of linguistic group. You hear the king of the Franks, the king of the Romans, the king of the Germans, the king of the Britons. It's not the king of Germany. There's no distinction of a geographic group. It's the areas where that language is spoken. And while that is a geographic area, that can shift. People can learn that language. They can lose territory. They can spread their culture. Areas can be annexed. In a real sense, out of the ancient world and into the medieval, you do see this idea of language being very important. Language is attached to culture. But if that's the case, the idea of ethnicity and haplogroup and race becomes almost completely useless. For example, just, just a quick side tangent to a later period, Consider the idea of the Black Irish, which are most often considered to be Spaniards who got marooned when the Armada was defeated. But even if it's not that, even if it's something else, they're most likely different in some way ethnically from the Irish. But they adopt that culture and they became Irish. But if you also look north of where Ireland is, Scotland, you see this very big split between the Highland tribes and the more feudal based southern lords. And over time, that split becomes less and less, and they just become Scottish, and they have a, a, a Gaelic culture that comes out of it. And as time passes, you have them kind of merge the English. And as they adopt the English language, and they become part of the United Kingdom, you have more trade and more connection between them. And all of a sudden, if you're Scottish, that kind of corresponds to where you live and who your ancestors are. But if, then you have an English person in that family tree, and then if you have the same government as England, and you're speaking the same language as England, you're kind of the same culture at that point. And at that point, it almost means more than your actual ethnic or national identity. But all of a sudden, it becomes relevant in the modern day when the policies of England separate from the policies of Scotland. There is some contention about maybe we should become separate again. And so it's an issue that comes up again and again, and people will emphasize one over the other. And the sort of time period and social economic circumstances it gets emphasized to a different degree. And oftentimes, like people in power, it can become emphasized to a very cynical degree. After all, what was the 1930s fascism and 40s, if not just the weaponization of this sort of ethnic tribalism? The second concept I want to talk a little bit about before we get really into the early dynastic period is something we mentioned just very briefly last time. That's the long gulfs of time and the sort of spread of technology. The theory I have heard that makes a lot of sense to me is that the reason why you have these massive gulfs of time that become shorter and shorter and then we get close to the modern day, it almost seems as though technology is accelerating at breakneck pace. Compare how long it took for the people of these, those early periods to transition from a Neolithic into a Bronze Age and then like a true material culture. It took thousands of years at a time. And then you look at the last 100, 200 years, we go from essentially steam locomotion-like to having power plants and space flight and mass communication. It's a rate that's so incredibly fast. And the theory I have heard, it boils down to how fast can you communicate? In the early Stone Age, you had to go over there and you had to talk to somebody. And then that person had to go talk to somebody else. And that person had to go talk to somebody else. And with no ability to write, that person is going to have to pass on that story enough for that to be remembered. And if you had a break from one area, how long would it take for that to go to every neighboring tribe? And is every neighboring tribe going to remember it? Once you go a little bit further and you have the introduction of writing, you have the introduction of a state that is large and bureaucratic, all of a sudden you have the ability to kind of disseminate that more quickly, and you have the ability of neighboring people to adopt those ideas because they have such a large and widespread and continuous material culture utilizing it. And you end up with this thing where once you go past writing, you can eventually get to stuff like mail systems. Once you get to the modern era and you have the ability to communicate with people not directly in front of you, once you have telegram and telephone and internet, it creates such an incredible pace that whereas in this era you're looking at the ability for a technology or an idea to go up a river valley one city at a time and slowly filtrate the Middle East, now there's no problem with someone working on a project talking to a colleague of theirs completely across the world. It's not so difficult from the International Space Station to shoot a message to our world. Like the barriers solely imposed by nature on the increase and spread of technology are essentially non existent. But in this time, those barriers were very real. So we begin today's 
discussion by returning briefly to Uruk. Uruk was the massive power in the region, so I want to discuss this thing, a little bit of why that period and that empire looked so different from what we actually call an empire later, the Akkadians. Because Uruk, as we talked about, was an actual hegemony in the region. It was a major center. It seems to be that the south had interest in a neighboring region, primarily the north, conducting economic trade. Whether that was government-sponsored, whether that was independently run, or whether that was a sort of colonization of the South by people who wanted to leave those king centers is not completely known, it's disputed. And what does seem to be certain is that Uruk material culture was infiltrated the North. And in exchange, they were bringing back materials to the South. Why Uruk looks so different from Akkad is Akkad represents a sort of national military expansion. Uruk is much more close to what people would be familiar today with what they call the American Empire. America largely inhabits the area that is settled by it, but it has influences throughout the world. There are military bases, there are trade networks, there are embassies and diplomats throughout the world, and we have allies, and we have all kinds of special relationships which place us as the most prominent nation, and the nation who is able to affect the most change on their whim anywhere in the world. The Rook similarly had a setup where they had an economic ties throughout. They seemingly established enclaves going up the rivers and then extracting resources from the northern portions of what would later be called Assyrian. The Assyrians of this time period seemed to have a slightly more developed metallurgy culture, and so often they would import finished metal goods to the Rook area. But other than metal, most materials were brought in similar to how the Europeans would have treated their colonies in their economic expansion period during the height of colonialism. They imported raw goods, and then they finished it, and they used that as either luxury items or to trade out for additional profits. The idea is tar, timber, etc., etc. The, the areas that actually had access to those would not have had the ability to shape and create and modify them the way it would And so Rook used this to provide an avenue to those peoples and those cultures to gain access times they wouldn't otherwise have, which would, in theory, bolster the middlemen, often tribal chieftains, who traded with the representative of Rooks. They would gain access to these high-level cultural items, which they could then distribute to their people and gain status. In exchange, they would give these raw materials, which they had a bunch, to a Rook. And so Rook was essentially taking the wealth of the surrounding regions enhancing itself. And the reason why Uruk stood out from the other cities is it was the biggest center at the time. During that period also, they did engage in some warfare. There is some evidence of at least one city where there's sling bullets and the signs of destruction in the Syrian region, where they think Uruk sent at least a few hundred soldiers and likely imposed its will. Perhaps they were trying to gain access to a trade route. Perhaps they were trying to overthrow a local king and put a more compliant one in place. Whatever the case was, they did engage in some military adventurism, which I suppose you could compare to like Panama and Granada and invading South America because fruit companies didn't have enough profits. But it wasn't quite the same as going and annexing someone else's country and literally occupying it for a couple hundred years. The thing is, the reason Uruk became what you could maybe call the superpower of the region, the hegemony of the region, is the largest city, but also probably the most technologically and culturally sophisticated region. They have the most efficient agriculture. They have the most advanced tool-making systems, the most advanced architecture, all of this stuff. It wasn't that much more. The people they were dominating, they were trading with, they were imposing their will upon, were really only a few steps behind them along the technological and cultural curve. More than that, the more Uruk exports its finished goods, its technology, for lack of a better term, the more the surrounding regions learn from it, they can use that to jumpstart their own technological sophistication. Really from the so-called end of the Uruk period of 3150 BCE up through the next, well, almost millennium, you see this process by which other cities, first neighboring cities in Sumeria itself, but later on other cities further north and beyond, catch up and ultimately surpass Uruk. Once Uruk has to deal with rivals who can basically swing at its level of power and influence and economic sophistication, then their hegemony begins to rapidly come to an end. They remain a prominent city for a long time, but they can no longer simply dominate the region as they had once done. And seemingly the reason why they were so much more, quote, sophisticated 
more or less boils down to what we talked about last episode is they had their agriculture producing more quicker than everyone else in the region had, and they were able to feed more people, and they had more specialized roles. And once people kind of caught up to that, and they were able to feed the same ratio of people, that all of a sudden wasn't such a big deal. So when Uruk loses power, it still has a significant cultural role. It is still the seat of Gilgamesh from the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it was the place where Inanna had her main temple, and the, and the tribute was sent. And so for some time, it did remain prompt. However, to jump forward a little bit and skip a little bit, we're going to say, just to give you the information about what happens to Uruk. Uruk goes through these later periods. It occasionally attains a major amount of power. It has a reign king and has uh, the ability to dominate the surrounding region, but it never has the far-reaching graph that it once had. It's never the hegemonic period-defining power it once was. But it does last for the entirety of what we're going to discuss today. But during the Arab invasions of the 8th century, the city was permanently destroyed and more or less remained undiscovered, untouched, until the later excavations. Well, like a lot of things in this period of time, the fall of Uruk from its hegemonic position is a relatively slow process. While we date you know, roughly the end of the Uruk period, the 3150 BCE, it still retains its a degree of its prominence about 150, 200 years after that. I call this the transitional period. Some call it the Jemdet Nasser period, named for the particular site where our first archaeological evidence of the new culture was found. Some call this a unique period in Sumerian history. I tend to believe really it's more of a variation in a slow development of Uruk culture, a continuation of its material and economic patterns, but one that further differentiates the culture of the Sumerians in the south from the more Semitic-speaking peoples in the north. But by 2900 BCE, the Uruk is no longer a prominent city that it once was. It remains a regional power, but now it faces numerous other rivals. This is referred to usually as what's called the Early Dynastic Period, which is usually dated from about 2900 BCE to 2334 BCE, which is the rise of the Akkadians, which we'll get to here soon enough. It's called the Dynastic Period because the single most important historical document that was first found is something called the King's List, or the Sumerian King's List. This is a long, complex document that theoretically uh, names the dynasties, names of kings and their reigns in different cities over the course of many hundreds and thousands of years. On the one hand, the king's list is by no means comprehensive. There are plenty of local city rulers who are not on this list. The king's list is supposed to mention kings who either supposedly ruled Sumeria, which virtually very few actually did, or at the very least, were able to impose their will on neighboring rival cities, at least for a time, and that earned you a spot on the list. Now, we can't take this to be 100% accurate. Uh, a lot of it is mythology. It was passed on and added to far later. The Assyrians were still making copies of the king's list hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later as part of this whole Sumerian cultural tradition they were part of. And some of these kings have ludicrously long reigns, but every king that's mentioned that has also mentioned the historical event that supposedly defined that reign. This is a historical document in the sense that people are recording names, places, dates, and events. It's often hard to actually line these dates up to the modern calendar because they counted their years by the king's reign. So the fourth year of Sargon's reign is this year. You can kind of sort of work backwards from that, but it's a very it's a fraught, pro difficult process. And we actually, some uh, historians think we're still actually probably translating Sumerian numbers wrong. And indeed, there actually is some thought that using alternate systems, which gives much more reasonable reign uh, time for some of these kings, even some of the supposedly legendary kings like Gilgamesh might be loosely based off some real people, but again, the mythology has overtaken it, even in ancient times. You also have a thing where the king's list varies. We found so many different examples in so many different periods that oftentimes if they list a very comprehensive list, it will have a king and it will list on multiple numbers because different lists claim they reign for different amounts of time. And some lists include some kings, not others. And some include kings to such a degree that if they were both true, they wouldn't quite fit because the timelines don't make, line up. There's a lot of games of telephone being played over centuries or even thousands of years with different uh, dynastic groups. And adding to the fact that the king's list was probably very much a kind of propaganda for those civilizations and the kings themselves, 
like it, like I said, historical documents can't be really accepted as true. We have to sort of analyze them and study them and compare them. And on the topic of propaganda, just for example, imagine you had a, a significant city goal or king in one of the northern Sumerian areas. Not not north as in Syria, but just sort of the north area of Sumeria. But you had another powerful one, say Ur, or Rook in the south. And they both claimed to be a regional superpower of Sumer and they were rivals. Very easily both of them could have a king's list where it lists almost the exact thing, same things up to their reign, and it gives completely different kings. And which one's better? We kind of have to look at you know surrounding regions and try to compare those and figure it out. It's a big, messy game of who is telling the truth. But nonetheless, this period and the king's list that kind of helps us to study it does indicate that we're entering a period in which, one, kings are beginning to emerge and overtaking priests as the center of political life in a city. And we're also entering a period in which numerous cities and numerous kings are increasingly jockeying for position and power. We're also seeing a steady decline in the importance of religion to Sumerian politics. It definitely goes away, mind you, but it definitely becomes less prominent. One of the most interesting examples of this, one of the first signs of this, is one of the primary archaeological finds, one of the premier archaeological finds, something called the Royal Cemetery of Ur. Ur being one of the big prominent cities that emerged during this period. Sir Leonard Woolley found it back in the 1930s, and while many of the tombs were looted, some of them weren't. This gave us a couple of different things. Now, one, material culture, some very fine statues, weapons, armor, jewelry, musical instruments, a lot of really high value, high quality things. Goldsmithing apparently was very well developed in this period. We also find examples that not only were kings, buried in these elaborate ceremonies, these large tombs with grave goods. We also find examples of mass human sacrifice. Soldiers dressed in armor, ladies in waiting in finery and jewelry, musicians with their harps and drums. Woolley wrote a number of books about this, and he was obviously speculating, and we still don't know 100% about this, because the Royal Cemetery of Ur dates to a very early, the first years. Perhaps it might even date to the transitional period, not the dynastic period itself. And while we don't find a lot of names, the few we do find often correspond to legendary heroes and demigods in later Sumerian writing. And the thing is, this doesn't happen anymore. We don't really find evidence of human sacrifice like this really ever again outside the royal cemetery and a few other isolated finds. The theory here was that these kings were probably still, you know, in sync. They were priest kings. And more than that, they were probably, if not actually worshipped as gods, the way say pharaohs would be, although some might have been. It's not unheard of throughout Western culture at this time for occasionally a king to be deified. At the very least, these were the representative of those gods on earth, and so their burials represent that kind of grandeur. They took their servants with them into the priests, take their places in the heavens. There's actually a poem called The Death of Gilgamesh, which describes a burial like this. So the idea survived, the story survived. But very early on, this stops being the case. Kings are still buried in elaborate tombs. I mean, kings generally are. Very few of those are found intact, unfortunately. Fairly early in the dynastic period, it seems that kings began to increasingly divest themselves of this religious prominence. They stopped being seen as such reverent figures. That process is somewhat long and convoluted, but we're going to try our best to elucidate it for you here. Based upon, again, archaeology, records, the king's list, and elsewhere, there are a number of cities that emerge in the dynastic period that really become the new prominent centers economically and politically. Listed from north to south, they are Sippar, Kish, Aksha, Ularak, Isin, Nippur, Adab, Zabalam, Shurupak, Uma, Girsu, Lagash, Nina, Badtibira, Uruk still, Larsa, Ur, and Eridu. And for context, those of you who might be familiar with other regions, about the start of this period, when you zoom out from Mesopotamia, the other regional powers and whatnot are the First and second dynasties in Egypt roughly correspond to the the early period. 2686 is about when the Old Kingdom arises. Proto-Hittites, the Hattians and the Hurrians are in the area around Anatolia. The Gutians, the Elamites, among others, are in Iran. The Minoans are in Crete. And the Indus Valley Civilization, the Harappans, are in the area of modern-day Pakistan. Now, all of these cities in Sumeria become increasingly powers unto themselves and will increasingly need to jostle for position. But two of these cities do seem to have a certain interesting prominence, not because of their political power, 
because of what they represented. And therefore, for example, the god it owed its allegiance to was Enlil, which was increasingly worshipped as the king of the gods, the chief deity of this period, which seems to replace Inanna in that role. And so Nippur becomes sort of the spiritual center of Sumeria and being able to claim to be, if not king of Nippur, at least legitimized by Nippur, gave a certain degree of you know, political legitimacy to a king who claimed that title. The city of Kish is sometimes called the crossroads of the city because it's far north, not the furthest, but very close to it. And in addition to uh, significant Sumerian populations, there are a good number of Semitic speaking people from Syria living there as well. And so there's this thought that those who could claim to rule Kish had a claim to ruling the whole world because they were the kings of Sumeria and the kings of the people who lived beyond Sumeria. And that said, those two tiles were fought over pretty viciously. And what we can tell, the dynastic period is seen by sort of defined by two things. One, the emergence of a very complex and highly structured socio-political and economic system, and the emergence of kingship to replace the priest kings of the previous period. There are two main elements to this economic system and how it relates to politics. The temple and the palace. The temple being defined as the chief temple of the god of the city, and the palace, of course, of the household of the king. Now remember, you have the NC, the priest king who heads up the chief state religion, and the Lugal is the king, he used that term somewhat incorrectly, who sort of handles defense and the military and other sort of more secular matters. In theory, they share power in earlier periods, but that will change we'll get to that in a second. But the way it worked was actually kind of interesting. We know a lot about the temples. The temples were major in the land owners, not universal. About a third of all the city's land was theoretically owned by the temple for the use of the god. And this land was further divided up. About uh, about 30% of a temple's land was used to produce uh, food, to feed the priesthood, and to provide uh, ritual offerings to the god and of that nature. Another third was used to pay the salaries of the various hangers-on and workers and employees and lesser priests who served the temple. And the remaining third was rented out to landless farmers in exchange for about one-eighth of the crop as a, a monthly but an annual rent. Now what did the temples do with all this stuff? We're talking a lot of agricultural goods. We're talking grains, vegetables, fruits. We're talking livestock. We're talking wool, milk, all that stuff. They mostly made things with it. The temples were major owners of slaves, but also major employers of skilled workers. A lot of women and children were actually employed as weavers and things of that nature. And they would make cloth, they would make tools, they would make all kinds of things and sell it. In fact, the temples actually licensed merchants to take this stuff and trade it for profit. Now, there was plenty of private economic ownership. Again, most of the land was privately owned to one degree or another. In addition to this, there's all kinds of interesting economic organizations, which are kind of very early forms of the guilds you saw emerge in the late Roman period of the Middle Ages. And these were very specific. You had, they were, they were called, the term is often translated as corporations, that's very incorrect. But these guilds, fishermen, they were fishing guilds, but were you in the freshwater fishers guild or the seawater fishers guild? Or were you in the brackish water, the estuary fishers guild? If you were in the herders guild, did you herd sheep or goats or both or donkeys or oxen or cows? Oh, which gender was it? Were you a herder of male sheep or female sheep? That actually mattered to which guild you were part of. And on and on it goes. This is sort of the origins of class distinction. You see people trying to safeguard their own economic interests and maximize their power in society by controlling the products they make and how much it's sold for and controlling all labor and anyone who isn't within the guild would have penalties and whatnot. So not only is the origins of kingship and urbanization and warfare here, this sort of beginning of class struggle and class consciousness begins here as well. In addition to this, these guilds also selected a leader called chieftain. Actually. Collectively, these chieftains actually did play a role in politics early on. That role minimizes more and more as time goes on, but you have some elements of this. Uh, more than that, this economic relationship really does fuel the class system in Sumeria that emerged at this time, which is very basic. Sumerian culture and law really only recognized two classes. You were a slave or you were a free man. Slaves, obviously, are individuals who were owned. Slaves were often captured in raids and wars, but they could also be enslaved for crimes and death and things of that nature. Free men, though, are broadly defined as anyone who's not a slave. 
which means that free men run the gamut from these landless farmers that are rent from the temples, up to including the king himself, who is probably the wealthiest, most powerful man in society. That doesn't last for very long. Now, we mentioned a couple of times that this is the era of kings and the emergence of a new kind of political power. In episode one, we mentioned the NC and the Lugal. The NC is the chief priest, the priest king who rules, and Lugal is handling military matters and things of that nature. In the dynastic period, this is the story of a religion taking more and more of a back seat and military matters becoming more and more prominent. In a very real sense, we see the emergence of what you might call warlords become king. Historically, a king is often just the most powerful and prominent warlord in a region. This is a very uneven process. It doesn't happen in one particular way, and it varies from city to city. Some cities still maintain the distinction between the two. In some cities, a single figure assumes both roles. In some cities, one absorbs the other. Like, we have this one city where the, uh, the king, who is the military leader, still calls himself an end city, but he's handed over his religious powers to another figure called the high priest now in Sumeria. In other cases, Lugal comes to mean something like king of kings, a king who can subdue neighboring cities and force the locals to swear allegiance to him, and the NC of that city is more of his vassal subordinate than anything else. There's no universal system for this. It's a complication of language. Language evolves over time, and words that mean one thing won't always mean that thing. While NC might have more or less meant king when you had that sort of proto-democracy, sort of electing city elders, and the city king was also the religious head, you see it later becomes a lesser king, and it later becomes a vassal king in the sort of proto-feudalism. And... The people of that era would not have necessarily been aware of what was in the earlier era, but there's some evidence that kind of comes and ebbs and flows. So, for example, we see Gudea of Lagash, who styles himself as more of a peaceful ruler in the era after Akkad. He adopts NC more or less to represent the fact that he doesn't want to have so much of a military role, and he found many temples as a spiritual role again. So you see a much earlier version of this, title be re-brought to prominence in that. It's, it's just the forms and variances of language over many centuries. In general, though, what this represents is the gradual decrease in the prominence of religion in a political role. It still remains very important as a social and cultural function, of course, and the gods are so widely revered, priests are still very prominent figures, but kings increasingly emphasize their military function, and also, the palace increasingly replaces the temple as the economic center of the city. It's a very gradual process. What's driven by, as you might expect, is the emergence of war. Now, we're talking this is a very large-scale war by the standard of time. Now, it's still very small wars, given its small region, small population. But still more wars. You might ask yourself, well, why? Why does suddenly, all, after all of this time, why do wars become, between these cities become so prominent and so significant that the military leader essentially becomes the chief political leader of these nations, these three states, rather. We think it's the same process that actually created the treaty in the first place, economic competition. Remember, after the climate change, which helped to create the modern environment of the region, people had to concentrate into the remaining intercultural region. That led to the emergence of large cities, the largest of which is probably about 30, 25,000 people or so at this time. Over time, again, with increased cultural techniques, better uh, harvests and more food supplies, populations continue to grow, which means that cities have to stretch out their well, economic agricultural heartlands further and further to survive. Well, there reaches a point where there's no room left to expand peacefully. These cities, the largest cities at the time, reach a point where they have subdued all the surrounding small villages and farms, they're pushing up and jostling against each other's borders. So now they're faced with the fact that if they want to expand further, if they need, either need more land for more cultural production, or simply if they just greedy and want more wealth, they have to take it from someone else. And even if you're not concerned with that, you have to be worried about someone else taking from you. And so cities have to militarize simply to survive in this new age of competition. Again, over resource. This is again a resource war is how it starts. However, over the course of the dynastic period, you know, some 600 years almost, these wars take on other connotations. They're still being fought for land and tribute and population and agricultural product in some ways, but 
now they're taking on a political nature. You know, well, this we deserve more, or we want more. Kings feel it's their right to impose their will upon others. Some ancient inscriptions talk about you know, the god of our city commands us to expand his hold upon earth, to smash his rivals, because as all ancient mythology is rivalries and feuds among the gods as well would play out on earth. Now, did those mythologies fuel the war? Those wars create the mythology? That's chicken or egg debates. But so near the end of the dynastic period, kings now begin, who are now military leaders primarily. Well, they still conduct certain religious functions, but they're primarily military leaders at this point. They begin to increasingly see the idea of unifying militarily this region of their command to create Sumeria, if you will, to rule over all of these peoples. And there are a number of kings throughout this period who make attempts at it. Again, in theory, anyone on the king's list at least had some success in conquering his neighbors, assuming that person was real because that's actually a serious question. But historically, based upon other inscriptions we find and documents and of that nature, we could say these kings existed and they did make pretty good attempts to conquer Samaria. You've got guys like Babragesi of Kish, Mesanapada of Or, Enatum of Lagash, Enshakushana of Uruk, Lugo Anmundu of Adab, and Lugo Zagesi of Uma. Lugo Zagesi probably the most successful in action, very nearly unifying these regions. But again, these kings fought rival right cities, they forced local NC to swear allegiance to them, they assumed the title of Lugal in many cases. Taking the title of King of Kish or King of Nippur was a very important part of this process of legitimizing herself as king of the region, king of the world. Because the world is a very small place for Sumerians. No sooner has Lugo Zagesi really made this very near complete conquest of Sumeria and very nearly made himself the king of kings, to use a later term, the Aztec period comes to an end as it's called the Akkadians emerge. So when you talk about how this area shakes down in a real politic way, the takeaway is more or less as cultivation increases and these cities are able to support more population, Baruch becomes less prominent. Either people leave a rook or just populations transition to other cities instead. And so what you have is a decentralization of sort of foreign power. A rook is unable to impose itself on every city. And these cities, they grow bigger and they develop kings. They have more centralization of domestic power. So you have this transition of a hegemon into a balkanization and warfare in the river valleys. In a real way, when you take away all these religious trappings and political ideas, it's not so dissimilar from imagining just a large-scale gang war on the streets of a major city. Every city is like a neighborhood. And some neighborhoods might be more significant. They might be important to hold because they're at crossroads, or they might have a significance for your particular group or all the groups, or they might produce more wealth to your enterprises. And so there's a real reason to do it. But as you expand out, you make yourself vulnerable to your rivals. There is a internecine violent competition between all these people to grab as much as they can. What happens when one gang is actually successful and beats up all the others and runs the whole city? One nation. I said the Akkadians are coming next. They're the ones who actually create the first Mesopotamian empire. Who are the Akkadians? In a very real sense, they are Mesopotamians who aren't Sumerian. They're speaking a one of those Semitic dialects we talked about. The Akkadians had lived for a long time in Sumeria, or at least in the region. There are significant numbers of them in Kish, for example, and they are practicing a Sumerian style culture. These new cuneiform alphabet to write things, which that's interesting in itself, because we know the grammatical differences between Sumerian and Akkadian are massive. In fact, it's almost fascinating that the Akkadians chose to maintain cuneiform rather than make their own alphabet, because I've heard it described as the equivalent of trying to write English using Chinese. It can be done, but it's a very complicated process. The Akkadians are this Semitic-speaking group who are living in central Mesopotamia and will overlap with the Sumerian regions in the north and around Kish. They're a known group. They're seen as outsiders to a point, but at the same time, they're also insiders. Remember, the title of King of Kish could mean King of the World. The Sumerians that represented ruling all peoples. The Akkadians were different, but not so much foreign in that sense. Well, the Akkadians rise to prominence really with the emergence of a figure that you've probably heard of as Sargon. His proper title was Shadukin, but a lot of prominent figures have anglicized names in popular folklore, so we'll stick with that explicitly. Sargon is kind of a nobody at first. He lives in Kish, obviously, and he is a 
not a servant, but he's definitely part of the court of the king of Kish, a man known as Urzababa. I love that name, by the way, Urzababa. Sargon is like a cupbearer or a sandal bearer. He's some minor functionary who serves the king, which that might not sound like much, but still, that's someone who's in the king's retinue in his court. So, you know, a man of prominence and social status. And we really wish we knew more about how this happened, but there's just too much lost. Sargon somehow usurps the throne and becomes king of Kish. Now, was this done like through a violent palace revolution? Was it done through secret assassination? Was he a chosen successor? As of right now, the sources are silent. All we know is that in 2334, Sargon becomes king of Kish. Not the first Akkadian to be king, by the way. There are a number of other kings in the king's list who have Akkadian names. So, not the first probably would not have been seen as all that significant at the time. But then, over a course of relatively few years, he proceeds to conquer and unify the entirety of Sumeria and some of beyond that. And he assumes the title of Lagash and he goes to Elipur and takes the hands of Enlil. We haven't mentioned that before, but one of the ceremonies of kingship in Sumeria was to go to the temple of the city you were conquering or ruling. And you had to grip the hand of the statue of the god. And the theory here being that if you were a worthy king, you would be accepted by the god, and if you were an unworthy king, they would somehow smite you. Which, you know, to us seems like a little bit of silly superstition, which is more than it is, but there are a few historical accounts of weird things happening in these ceremonies. I believe there's a famous, I think it's a Babylonian or a Syrian king who's crushed by a statue in the temple during this ceremony, which is the clear sign of the gods' favor, obviously. Sargon does all of this, and he founds what some call the Akkadian Empire, and he will rule over it for about 45 years, an exceptionally long reign in a lot of ways. Now, Sargon's primary achievements during this period are mostly military. Again, he marks the conquest of various cities. He marks wars against neighboring territories. Now, most of the official inscriptions come from his son's reign, and so we think it's a lot of you know, building a national myth around his father as the founder of the dynasty. And certainly Sargon leaves an impression upon Mesopotamia not soon to be forgotten. Everyone kind of follows his example. But we have accounts, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, that he went as far north as Anatolia and made war upon the Hittites. References made to conquering the Cedar Forest and the Silver Mountains, which the Silver Mountain refers to a different area in central Turkey. He talks about, in his inscriptions, going to the Taurus Range and fighting the Assyrians. There's discussion of going down to the Oman region, smiting various local kings, fighting the Elamites that I ran. Most of this either probably didn't happen, or at the very least was much more small scale. These are probably more like large raids and actual conquests. Still, it was played up as I subdued the entire river valley, and I washed my weapons in its feet. That's a phrase we'll see a lot more later on. The king who washes his weapons in the Persian Gulf is symbolically claiming to have conquered the entire river valley from north to south. And Sargon's reign is a very long one. Um, very effective one in some ways. And in fact, there's all kinds of stories as well about what happens here. Like, for example, it's, it's saying that the end of his reign, the last years of his reign, the people revolted against him, and yet the so-called old lion of the north went forth and smote his rivals and showed them that yeah, he still had his teeth. He also constructs a new capital. Uh, some translate it as Akkad, some call it Agave, but it's the same thing. It's a new city built exclusively to house the new king of kings, the king of the world, or as one of his successors called himself, the king of the universe. I should say it is a new capital, but there is some evidence by some previous reference to Akkad that may have been at least a small urban center at some point previous. And sadly, we really don't know what happened to it. Uh, Sargon's capital was lost in ancient times. It's never really been found. Well, never identified. There are a number of cities dating to this period we found the ruins of, but we've never found any inscriptions to identify them. Unlikely, I think, in Sargon's case, it wouldn't find something in the city. But we don't really know what happened to it. There's some theory that it's Baghdad. Yeah, the main theories, I believe, are that it's here Baghdad, or it's that some distance down the stream in one of the suburbs of Baghdad or a nearby area. But that's not for sure, and Saddam Hussein actually did a decent amount of his own sort of archaeology in the region, hoping to more or less drum up the idea of some sort of Sumerian Mesopotamian identity to get backing of his people, which largely didn't work. The thing that makes Sargon, though, particularly significant is 
not just that he subdued and unified the region militarily. It's not just that he was able to claim the title of king of the world. It's not just that he built a new capital, or at least designated a new capital to symbolize a new era. It's that he founded a dynasty and was able to pass this title on to it for several generations. This wasn't just a, a warlord who had great success as empire falls apart upon his death. The Sargonic era, as some call it, was some five or six generations of kings who all ruled. And his son Rimush ruled after him from 2278 to 2270 BCE. Very unsuccessful successor, uh, supposedly after a very unsuccessful war against the Elamite, his own servants killed him. Uh, the actual document is fascinating because it says, quote, his servants killed him with their kunuku, which usually means cylinder seal, though we, we think it must mean something else in this context, because they're awful small to beat someone to death with. Maybe they dumped like a whole barrel of them on him. It's possible. But his brother, uh, Manish Chusa, takes over and reigns from 269 to 285 BCE. And Manish Chusa is actually able to conduct a number of very successful campaigns, again, down into the Oman region to capture copper reserves there. He also is able to launch successful wars against the Elamites and a few others. In fact, he went as far north as it probably the edges of Anatolia again, and accepted the tribute from a variety of people who know like the Hatti, the Lugabai, and a few others. He's replaced by his son, Nanam Sin. I, I should point out that many ancient kings have the term Sin in their title. It's because Sin is the moon god, and it's a very prominent and important god in the pantheon. So a lot of kings incorporate that name into their official reign names. Anyway, uh, Nanam Sin, who, by the way, is one of the kings which is deified. Like the the uh, pictogram for God is included in his official descriptions. But he, and he was very successful, again, in expanding the power of the nation, expanding the borders to some of the peripheral regions. We think he was fighting wars against like Aleppo and Ebla in Syria, and supposedly uh, conquered both those cities. He also had dealings with and partially destroyed the city of Mahdi, which was a very prominent city in later period, also the crossroads between Syria and Mesopotamia. Although some things have happened late in his reign, we don't really know what, but there's a legend called the Kuthian legend of Naram Sin, which claims at the end of his life, the king of Akkad was bewildered, confused, sunk in gloom, sorrowful, and exhausted. Again, we think we've got a foreign invasion, but we're not sure who may have pushed into the region, and that's the old king that they couldn't deal with at the time. Still, not a, one more generation of kings rules after him. After Naram Sin, you have Shark Shadi, the last king of the Sardonic period, from 2217 to 2193 BCE. And while Shark Shali has a fairly significant reign, Again, it seems to be a reasonably successful king defeating the enemies that his father had dealt with. After his death, which he seems to have, like his distant ancestor Rimush, been taken out by a palace coup of some type, the Akkadian Empire more or less disintegrated. One thing you'll notice if you're a big consumer of various media is every presenter, every lecture, every video, whatnot, it has different folks and they talk about different facts. So I mentioned the YouTuber Lindy Beige earlier and gave more details. We've covered the Akane Empire and we've talked about it quite a bit. But a video I watched this week to refresh me on some of this by a YouTube channel called Kings and Generals has a number of other facts I found quite interesting. If you'd like to know more about some of the specific details of the goings on of the Akane Dynasty that we didn't cover here, you might go take a look at that channel. So to return very briefly to the city of Akkad and go through exactly its fate. Very quickly, I want to talk about how it actually became quite important. They made it more or less the new site of Inanna worship, which is now called Ishtar. A number of gods were renamed other the Akkadians, and her portfolio was slightly changed. She became less and more just a fertility god and became more of a war, sex, love god type of thing. But the city itself, it remained a noble city. Kings did come from it. It was mentioned in some histories. But by the Neo-Assyrian Empire, after the Bronze Age collapse, it seems to be gone. There are no more references to Akkad, and it's possibly lost for even a thousand years prior to that. So the question becomes, how exactly do these sages become ruins and become entirely lost? There's a number of theories and a number of demonstrations, demonstrable facts we can say about this. 
the one hand, the war is responsible. It's not unheard of for during major conflicts for rivals to just destroy a city. Again, these are mud brick cities by and large. It's not too difficult to pull down the walls, to burn the timbers, to scatter the peoples and end the city that way. Now, this can lead to situations, though, even then, where it's re-inhabited and you get a new city on top of the old one. More common, though, is a combination of factors. For example, we know that thanks to their violent flooding, the Tigris and Euphrates have changed course a few times. It's entirely possible that the river changes course and suddenly the region dries up and people can leave. In addition to this, we talked about land salinization's process whereby uh, irrigation deposits minute amounts of salt if not handled correctly, which is still an issue in agriculture today. This causes loss of soil fertility and at past a certain point, well, suddenly you want your fields in order to produce enough food. Again, a site. This gradually shrinks in importance, and eventually, again, either through, again, loss of fertility, changing river courses, or what have you, people just drift away. And the thing is, again, these are mud brick cities. Once people stop living there, it doesn't take long for the land to be claimed. It rains somewhat in uh, Mesopotamia. It's not a lot, but it doesn't rain there. And over time, the roofs leak, the mud erodes, and the buildings collapse. It's just piles of mud again. River floods is the same thing, but river floods also deposit new soil, which further buries the site. In addition to this, you occasionally see situations where you know, a particular group particularly wants a city gone. And this is usually going to be warfare, but again, it's not unheard of for later groups to intentionally stamp out cities, to kill the memory, if you will, of the nation they defeated. And the Achaeans certainly were not the most popular dynasty. They faced many rebellions inside their empire. Oh, indeed. In fact, the of Shark Ali Shadi's, the end of his reign, the revolt that overthrew him, coincides with lots of internal revolts, cities declaring independence, order which would be ruled by the Akkadian United States. You also see external invasions. The Lullaby people from the north, the Guti and the Elamites from the east, the Amorites from the west. There are even official documents. The uh, Shark Ali Shadi's records of his reign mention you're building the fortress of Martu to hold the Amorites at bay. So we end up in a situation where we don't know which city it is. We don't know exactly where it's at. We don't know if it's been found. It's, it's even possible that in the changing of the course of the river, that erosion could have completely swept the city away. And I'm not saying it happened to Akkad, but is it possible it happened to that or other cities? Certain. And in the modern day, when we try to uncover these cities and do more exploration, it's heavily hampered by the amount of warfare and terrorism and instability. Even more than that, we have the we have a problem related to the previous discussion I brought about what Westerners have done for these ancient sites. Even today, there's a massive problem of looting. The Ur-3 bureaucracy that I mentioned last episode, huge amounts of it, and huge amount of Assyrian tablets have actually been stolen by looters and sold to private collectors in the Western market. And there's a massive debate between Western scholarship and whatnot as to whether or not these tablets should even be translated, because untranslated tablet is worth less on the market than translated. And there are some scholars who say, no, if these are in private hands, we will not work. But others say, well, we could use that knowledge anyway. And it becomes a debate of, should we encourage that? Is it okay for them to be translated and perhaps not properly studied, not put into proper context? This could even dilute our understanding of it. When you look at the situation where you're very limited on where we can explore, how much we can explore, and what we can find, and what is left to fall into our hands after these many waves of looters, of natural disasters, of intentional destruction, things fall through the cracks, and even something as significant as the seat of power of the first military emperor is possibly lost forever to history. The thing we mentioned about the fall of the Akkadian that caused the dynasty of Sargon by the end wasn't the most popular. The thing is, despite all of this, it was a powerful impression left behind. And I think very much Sargon and his successors were aware of this and trying to build this mythology. Now think about, we talk about you know, Sargon's you know, actual name and name is you know, Shadu Kin. We have Shara Kali Shari, the last king. Those names have some very interesting meaning. Shara Kin more or less translates to legitimate king. And Shar Kali Shari is more or less the king of kings. And so it's fine to call yourself king of kings, supposedly in Kyle. Cyrus did that. You have the religious connotations of Jesus doing that in the New Testament. But when you actually adopt that as your royal name, when you're referred to as king of kings or you're referred to as legitimate king, you might be making up for something. There's a real possibility that this was active propaganda used at the time to try to legitimize its rule. While there may have been Akkadian kings, you didn't have a king unify the region to the extent that he had. 
the entire region hadn't had to bend the knee to a semi-foreign ruler. The Akkadians were still seen as a somewhat different people. Akkadian kings adopt these names somewhat similar to the way popes did. If you look at these popes, they adopt the names of Urban or Innocents. Those were specifically chosen for reasons. Urban was picked, for example, after the Third Schism to try to signal to the Italian people that he would be an Italian pope. Which he, of course, then died in the Great Schism, continued on, but way into it. Modern popes even do the same thing, where they will pick a name specifically of a figure they'd like to emulate, whether it's a former pope or perhaps a name tied to a uh, monastic order. The uh, origins of that more or less have their beginnings here with Sargon and the previous ones who will thrust Naram Sin. He has the name of a god in his name, or they will put the name of their city in their name, or they will shove Lugal into their official king name. It's more or less to try to put themselves above the others and try to broadcast like, oh, I am legitimate. Look at my legitimate name. There may have been some success to it, but seemingly these rebellions and these fights kind of put some real incredulity as to whether or not anyone really thought Sargon was the real legitimate king. And yet the funny thing is, is that while you do see these rebellions and clear signs that people weren't necessarily believing it, everyone tries to emulate the example, the fight over being the new king of kings. is such a real struggle that even if these cities are so eager to not be ruled by foreigners, they're also eager to impose their rule on their neighbors. It is the, the old process of like the first adopters come up with the idea, but they're often not the most successful. You have to see how it's done, change your patterns, and do a little bit better the second round. This is when we see trends that come about much later in history, too. Like, when we see these local rebellions, local kings, or even seemingly rising up of uh, Sumerians versus Semitic peoples, it shows a sort of preference to local rule. And the origins of divine right are also here when people take these names of MCs and they put the names of gods in them. These trends that we see played out throughout time, the idea of, We'd rather be ruled by our own people, even our own local tyrant, than one from somewhere else. You see it in the Akkadian period. You see the origins of people trying to come up with a fancy title, whether it be an Archduke or the Tsar of Russia trying to emulate the name of Caesar. So after the death of Shah Kali Shadi around 2193 BCE and the disintegration of the Akkadian Empire, you enter into another sort of transitional period, which lasts about, which lasts about 70 years. During this time, you saw various internal revolts, either from local city leaders, or even actually various Akkadian governors and military commanders who sought to basically carve out their own chunks of territory. There were also external invasions. Again, I mentioned the Lullaby from Anatolia, the Guti, the Elamites, the Amorites, and others. But the Guti peoples were actually able to make a decent claim to conquering Mesopotamia after this. That wasn't a complete conquest. They didn't claim to be a new empire in that nature. Large numbers of them sweep in, they seize control of a few critical cities, and they kind of establish themselves as a new power in the region. The thing is, though, is that unlike a lot of other groups who will come in later and do this, the Guti were never really seen as legitimate successors to the Sumerian culture or the Sargonic political system. And so over the course of the next seven decades or so, Various cities continue to revolt, they continue to fight, they continue to try to throw off this foreign rule, as some call it, even though, in reality, the Guti were not ruling Mesopotamia. But around the year 2120, the NC of Uruk, once again, Uruk playing a last, you know, kind of prominent role here, the name Utu Higel, who is the leader of that city, launches the so-called revolt, in which he defeats the Guti, again, to believe his own claims, over the course of the next seven or so years, proceeds to reunify Sumeria under a new empire. Some call this the Neo-Sumerian, even Neo-Akkadian period. And I think I've seen references, I don't know how true this is, only one place. I've heard references that some claim Utahadel claims descent from Sargon, though. How true that is is debatable. By 2113 BCE, for the most part, Mesopotamia and Sumeria are more or less reunified to a new Sargonic Empire in terms of its borders. No sooner is this done than one of Utahagel's own ministers, a man named Ur Namu, asserts the throne from him and makes himself the new Lugal of Sumer and Akkad, as they call it now on. Oh, cursed, sudden but inevitable betrayal. Ur Namu, though, is from Ur originally, and he founds what's often called the Third Dynasty of Ur, or Ur III. The hill reigned from 2113 to 2093 BCE, and 
establish this new Ur-3 period, as some call it. And the thing is, Ur-3 is a fair distance of time, not super long, though. But they actually noted for a lot of fascinating things. Like ur Namu, for example, from fragmentary records we have, was the first king, at least that we know of historically, to actually dictate a written law code, a universal royal law code for his empire. Now, Hammurabi wasn't the first, but Hammurabi's code is found intact, and ur Namu's code is quite fragmented. And Hammurabi's code was pretty widespread. We found the best example in Susa, which is in Iran. The thing about ur Namu's law code, which I find fascinating, is how in some ways modern, you know, unlike the Code of Hammurabi, which is known for the law of retribution, they call eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. The Ernamu's Code is often more based on things like economic compensation for crimes and things of that nature. They also ordered the construction of new agricultural projects, the construction of new canals, cultural things. We think the amount of land to cultivate around Ur expanded considerably during his reign. He also was the one to revive and expand the construction of ziggurats. We haven't mentioned those before, but ziggurats are the so-called step pyramids of Mesopotamia, large structures of which temples are built on top of. Now, small ziggurats, and ziggurat actually just means build high in Sumerian. Ziggurats were being constructed in earlier periods of temples, but Urnamu has massive ones built, multiple stage ones that towered over the cities. In fact, some historians think the legend of the Tower of Babel has its start from the ziggurats that were being constructed during Earth 3. I've heard that supposedly farmers up to 20 kilometers away could see the temple on the top of the ziggurat. It is possible, given how flat and featureless the region is. I don't know for certain, but it wouldn't surprise me all that much that it's true. So Urnamu is a very successful administrator in a lot of ways. He codifies the law, he establishes land reclamation and building projects, he restores temples, builds his grand ziggurats. In the old Mesopotamian style, he really does establish himself as a legitimate successor to this new empire, even if he doesn't call himself the legitimate king in that sense. And he passes power on to his son, Shulgi, and Shulgi will rule for about 2092 BCE to 2047. Now, Shulgi is a little like his father in that he's very much an administrative leader. He's also a war leader as well. So, for example, Shulgi decreed that a new standard system would be used to measure and weigh grain. This is not universal, but it's the first real attempt at making a standardized system of weights and measures, which is, again, historically a very big problem for a lot of society. And while it only really deals with grain, where taxes are paid in grain, and salaries are often paid in money being used to a little bit, but mostly in grain locally. And so having a universal standard of this much grain is a unit. That makes taxation much easier, it makes trade much easier, it makes a lot of things a lot easier. In addition to this, he also ordered the construction of schools. The royal scribal colleges, as some call them, of Ur and Nippur were established to teach literacy. Again, a very rarefied and small-scale clientele for some of the rich, primarily taught here. But no longer is writing just the preserve of scribes who pass on the art to their children. Now the state is going to educate people to serve in the bureaucracy. So you need these scribes for the state to function. He also fought the Hurrians, the answers to the Hittites in the north, fought the Elamites and others. And in fact, through a combination of his building projects, his reforms, and his very successful military campaigns, he was deified as well. He was also declared a living god and worshipped as such for his lifetime. Power passes on after him to his son of Amasin, about 2046 to 2038 BCE. And it's under Amar Sin's reign that the Ur 3 period really begins to develop a complex centralized bureaucracy to rule over these states. Increasingly, local kings are being displaced and replaced with governors. There are military commanders, civilian commanders, or both in some cases, often answerable to the king. Road networks, communications to post offices, I guess, in modern terms. The creation of royal institutions, the royal watchdog institutions, to watch over local leaders to make sure they're not, you know, usurping power, plotting coups, or I guess embezzling tax funds. Temples are stripped of almost all their political power during this period, and the state is going to take over most of their functions, including economically. Now it is the state which is the major layer. The king's palace rents land and keeps slaves to harvest crops to pay its officials, 
but it also manages the manufacturing of finished goods. You get through huge numbers of state-owned slaves and state employees. The state licenses merchants to go conduct trade. Basically, under Amar Sin's reign, the Ur-3 period it becomes this, in some ways, very modern, very bureaucratic state, at least in certain ways and certain trappings. After Amar Sin, his son, uh, Shu Sin, will reign for a relatively brief period of time, 2037 to 2029. BCE. And Shu Sin really has to deal with a lot more problems than his father and grandfather had done. We see another large scale migration of peoples beginning to occur during this period. Once again, it's the Amorites, people that the Akkadians had fought for the period. And while we can't call this necessarily an invasion per se, there's no like central horde leader leading the Amorites in a conquered wave, but a combination of movement, migration, and some conquests and raids put increased pressure on the north and the west. And ultimately, again, through a combination of internal discontent over the increased centralized control, and I imagine the a certain degree of anger over deposing local kings and stripping the temples of their traditional prerogatives, combined with this foreign pressure, begins to weaken the state considerably. By 2028 BCE, and the reign of Ibi Sin, the last of the Earth Three Dynasty, this Neo-Sumerian slash Neo-Akkadian Empire basically vanishes. Again, massive internal revolts break out, and the Amorite people move into the power vacuum, and thus. Just as, as the Akkadians met, met there and at the exact same process, so too did the Third Dynasty of Ur fall at the dust of history. Some older Soviet historiography posits Ur-3 as this sort of ancient proto-communist state. And some people made that comparison given how large and bureaucratic and secular it is. But I think that it's very hard to actually compare Ur-3, which is essentially led by a king and does still have a decent amount of land ownership and whatnot, to be communism. It doesn't really have the basic tenets of sort of class struggle and the emphasis on the power of the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. There's not, there's none of that kind. So it's more close to what I would say be a sort of proto-absolutism, where the state has a massive amount of control. Um, it certainly has origins close to sort of government planning, central plan, the, the government deciding what is produced, when, why, having direct hand in the economy at a very large scale. And the origins of mercantilism, where they directly sponsor economic ventures, where they the city government is directly in control of the finances that flow through the hands of the citizens. All that central planning, that government interference in the economy, it actually does allow for a very systemized and very expansive state. Or at the time was considered to be likely the largest city. Some estimate that it was 65,000 people by the year 2030 BCE, which is a pretty massive city for that period. In fact, if you compare that to later medieval Europe, very few cities in West Europe would have been that size. Instead, I think, is interesting when you look at Ur and this idea that it could have been a pro-communist state or whatever it was, it brings in a very interesting idea, a dichotomy, I think, between the modern and the ancient. Because if Ur represents this proto-government plan, this central planning, the Uruk period likely represents proto imperialism and a sort of economic empire and the exploitation that we now see through the first world to the global south and through Europe toward the rest of the world during colonialism. When you compare the local uprisings and the preference for local kings versus outsiders, that rings of nationalism in later eras. And if you look at the idea of these merchant expeditions sent out by Uruk and the economic uh, power that made it so significant, you know, that's that's capitalism. But if you look prior to Uruk, there's a lot of theories about the city sponsors socialism. The farmers bringing a large percentage of the drainage, putting in the temple's granaries, the temple redistributing it in a way that's equitable and useful for society. And if you look earlier than that, it's, it's hard to say. Were tribal people more similar to a sort of capitalist mindset? Did they prefer to maximize the benefit of their tribe and then compete with other tribes? Did they engage in active trade? Were they more of a socialist communal group? Like, was it a cooperative thing where there was no ownership? The idea of primitive communism is often both. And if that's the case, if you have these 
communist, socialist, imperialist, mercantile distinctions back then. Is it useful to actually call them proto, to call them quasi, to call them the forerunners? Or are we really looking at ideas that we've had for tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years? Is it human nature to impose your will on others, to take from them, to seek profit, to maximize your own gain? Well, it certainly seems so for certain people at certain times. The, all the wars and the empires that have happened, all the expansions of colonial power and the economic interests. But at the same time, it seems that it's also human nature to cooperate, to share, to move toward a common good. How many times have we seen people who decide that in their interest it would be better to cooperate? After all, we all teach our kids that, you know, share your toys, be nice to others. You'd rather have them as a friend than an enemy. And throughout these centuries and millennia of civilization, you see this back and forth of individualism versus group identity. And the group identity is defined by different things, whether it's ethnicity or race or nationalism. And it brings up the question of, are any of these ideas new? Or are we just rehashing and putting names on them? Are we just getting more sophisticated and throwing ideas on it? Is it correct to imagine that the people who, quote-unquote, invented socialism and communism, is it is it correct to believe that Marx came up with a revolutionary idea, or was he simply putting words to something that people in the Akkadian Empire, in Uruk, perhaps earlier than them, had struggled with for thousands of years? The, the last thing I will say about that, if you are actually interested in this sort of proto-communism, there are a few societies that semi-fit that mold in the ancient period, though, some are closer and some are further from the Ur period. Whereas Ur and similar powerful states in Mesopotamia, I would call sort of quasi-absolutist or just very high on the status category of their political ethics. If you look at, say, the Indus Valley civilization in Pakistan, they seem to be a society that very much did lack internecine warfare, that lacked a massive class struggle. If anything, it did seem to be some sort of communal socialist society, though we know relatively little of it. Though, if you were looking at a state that actually fit that mold a little closer, well, not a perfect fit, Sparta isn't too far off, given the way that in its society, if you were a Spartan, you were ensured a certain level of treatment, and you were allowed to get aware of certain things, and the idea was you served the state, and the state served you for this purpose of sustaining the martial Spartan lifestyle. It's not exactly communist, but if you look at some of the more modern blended ideologies, the national Bolshevism, which is kind of the economics of Bolshevism and the cultural practices of the far right, fascists and whatnot, it isn't so dissimilar from the way the Spartans had the society where if you were a Spartan, if you were a warrior or the mother or future mother of a warrior, you certainly had this expectation of a level of treatment and of status in society. But if you were an other, one of the slave society helots, you were there to serve them and serve the state. By 2028 BC, Earth 3 comes to an end, or at least the process of coming to an end. This new group of people we talked about called the Amorites. Again, known in previous periods, but not the famous Mesopotamians in previous periods in the event. What makes them significant is that one of the cities they will either found or at least take over and co op is referred to as the Gate of the Gods. You would call it Babylon. And Babylon will not only dominate the next era of history, it continues to be an important center for many centuries afterwards. And still a sort of societal and cultural touchstone today. This has been the second part of our series on Mesopotamia. We are the History Hour with Mr. Kent and Professor White. Most likely, all the shows from here on out will follow the same trend of actually not being an hour, but hey, extra content. If you like this, please share it with your friends and anyone else who enjoys history. You can find us on YouTube and SoundCloud under the History Hour. You can also follow us on Twitter. And if you absolutely just love this show and like to donate, you can find us on Patreon. We'll put the links wherever you find them on whatever media platform this is supposed to. Welcome once again to the post credits lightning round where we just discuss silly and fun things that didn't really fit anywhere else. So, here's a question you're probably not asking yourself, but you should be. Was Sargon of Akkad, the first emperor in the history of mankind, as we recognize it, was his father a gardener or a shape changer? The answer is neither. Aw. Sargon was a gardener, and his mother was the shape changer. 
There's a story uh, that's written after Sargon assumes kingship, which heavily mythologizes his early life and his origins, and probably seeks to somewhat obscure his palace coup that brought him to power in the first place. The translation that I read reads, My mother was a changeling, though we're not entirely certain that that's an accurate translation of the actual Judeo form. My father I knew not. The brothers of my father, apparently any brothers of my father, lived in the hills. My city is Azukaranu, which is situated on the banks of the Euphrates. My mother bore me in secret. She set me in a basket of reeds and sealed the lid with bitumen. She cast me into the river, which rose not over me. The river bore me up and carried me to Aki, the drawer of water. Aki took me as his son and reared me. Aki appointed me as his gardener. While I was gardener, Ishtar granted me her love, and for four and forty years, I exercised kingship. So there are various accounts, supposedly. Some uh, scholarship points mostly toward Sargon's mother supposedly being a priestess or high priest. And there are references in the king list about his father being unknown. It goes to the whole, we don't know. If only there were more records in time and history and not degraded them into nothing. Once again is, how much do we really know about this guy? He was the guy who reigned in Akkad. He founded this empire. He had this relatively short-lived dynasty. But we don't really even have a clear picture of him. Like None of his statutes survived. The, the one that was often attributed to him is most likely his grandson. Where do we gain our facts and how much of it is just legend building? We don't even know his name before he assumed the title Shadowkin. In addition to this, though, we kind of have to assume that Sargon, for all of his potential virtues, was definitely an egomaniac, which I guess is part of being a king. According to himself, you know, not only is he the king of kings, not only is he the legitimate king of the land, not only was he banging the goddess of war. In addition, after assuming all of his powers and conquering his regions, he actually had an official inscription made, which we found. It says, Now, any king who wishes to call himself my equal, go where I go and do as I did. Basically, through all of you, I'm better than you. Prove it if you think otherwise. And sort of a call out saying, if you're my equal, you could do as much as me, but you probably won't do any more because I conquered the whole world. 